Hello and welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy. Take note that at the end of this episode, you'll have an opportunity to take a Berkeley Online course for $100 off the original price. Stay tuned for the credits or look for the details in the meta description of this episode. But now, take note of Matt Ward. He records music under the name M. Ward, and his latest album, which just came out last week, is Migration Stories. It is his 11th album under the M. Ward moniker, and his first on Anti Records. Now, you may also know him as the him of She and Him. Zoe Deschanel, of course, is the she. And we spoke recently via the Zencaster app, and I apologize, dear listener, that my mic was a little hot. But we spoke before the coronavirus pandemic began, and when he was planning to begin a tour in late April, so we do talk quite a bit about the way he approaches a live performance, which I hope is something we will someday soon be able to all experience again. Anyway, Matt Ward's life and music began with his family, a Beatles songbook, and a neglected guitar. Let's let him tell you all about it. My dad always listens to country music, a lot of gospel, and my mom was always listening to a lot of classical music, and my brothers and sisters listened to everything else. I grew up with a lot of uh, influences. My brother had a, had a guitar that was just sitting around his closet, and I one day just thought, oh, what's this thing? Started learning songs that I loved. I got this gift, the Beatles chord book from A to Z, and I just started going through that uh, like crazy around age 15. And, uh, so he didn't. He had stopped playing. I'm guessing. You know what? I don't know, know if he ever played at all, or if it was just you know getting gathering dust in the in the closet. Nobody seemed to mind. <laughs> <laughs> was it a nice guitar, or was it a hand me down he got? Or no, it was like a guitar that cost about twenty five dollars. It was yeah. called a Carlos. I'm not familiar with the brand. Yeah, n- no, very few people are. <laughs> So you take that guitar, make it your own, and you get the Beatles book. Were, were you always interested in the Beatles already, and and who turned you on to them, or was that just Los Angeles radio? I think radio had a, had a big part of it, but uh, I started playing music with some friends in high school. I was just gathering as much information as I could. I was just you know really excited about the idea of of learning chords and learning these chord progressions. It was something I was able to do on my own, and I didn't need to rely on anyone else. Else to, to to be around or uh, you know to schedule anything and that was a, a really you know big part of I think my my life is being able to work on my own as opposed to a lot of other instruments like if I decided to be a drummer or a bass player or a clarinetist or something I think those sorts of instruments rely on uh, collaboration and I still love collaboration but but most of the work I do is, is on my own mm-hmm. still to this day right. a lot of that has to do with the instrument that that i chose or it chose me i don't know right it called called out to you from the closet maybe maybe Let me out of here maybe <laughs> <laughs> so when did you start to play for other people right around the end of high school I, I started playing with a couple friends that were really into heavy metal and i never really got that into it we found this even ground in in, in the beatles and um rock and for lack of a better word punk music that was coming out of los angeles that i had the opportunity to go see uh there was a label called sst oh yeah that was really influential for me so that's when i bought my first uh, electric guitar yeah i i really never looked back i I always thought it was going to be uh, a hobby and uh, it ended up turning into this weird career that I have. Right. So when you were going to see SST shows, like what, I, I guess, what bands are we talking about? What, what's this like early 90s or? Yeah, uh, 90s, it was Firehose, uh, Mike Watts, or any any project Mike Watt had, um, I went to go see, and that had a huge influence on me. And then Sonic Youth uh, and Dinosaur Jr. and the Meat Puppets, all of those those four uh, took me a long way and really got me curious about uh, what you can do with the guitar, and um, especially as, as far as Sonic Youth is concerned. 
concern with different uh, guitar tunings. And uh, that's around the time I discovered Joni Mitchell, learned about some of her guitar tunings, and uh, the guitar started to just snowball with this mystery. And um, and I'm really still still in that place with the instrument, and uh, it's it's never ending, especially when you start playing with alternate tunings. And that's a, a really big part of, of my life is playing with alternate tunings. When, when did that become a part of your life? Uh, when I discovered that um, Sonic Youth and, and Joni Mitchell were doing it, it just opened up this Pandora's box. And then I discovered John Fahey and started to try to learn some of the tunings he would use and uh, some of the right hand techniques. That was it more in college when I discovered uh, John Fahey, but that was just another another door that opened into the, the, the possibilities of the instrument. Right. Did, did you ever have any formal lessons or is it all self-taught and... All self-taught, talking to friends. Um, I used to get excited about guitar magazines, which, you know, usually they were all like heavy metal people on the cover. But whenever there was someone that wasn't, I got into that. Uh, Johnny Marr was on the cover one. I remember being really excited about going out and buying that that issue. Uh, Lindsey Buckingham. I got most excited when you could read about these different approaches to, to the guitar. Eric Johnson comes to mind. He, oh, Yeah. He, great great guitar player and uh, so from the start when you're performing are, are you performing as m ward or matt ward or uh in college or when did you start using that moniker and if not by then what were some of the other earlier names you were going by uh, uh, in college, uh, for some reason, I had a nickname of M. Ward, and then uh, I made my first cassette tape in college. I knew that there was somebody else out there in the music business named Matt, Matt Ward or Matthew Ward. So without giving it two thoughts, I just thought, okay, I'll just call this uh, M. Ward, and then it just kind of stuck. It's definitely, you know, not anything I planned on keeping. It's a little bit hard to pronounce. Right. But right. It, is, it is what it is. Like, do people call you for interviews and be like, hey, M, how's it going? Yeah, and I've grown used to that, and that's fine. You know, it could be a lot worse. Well, I remember when you, you came out, I think Papa M had just come out, too, uh, David Pajo's project, and, and both of you guys were that guy with M in their name doing a Daniel Johnston cover. That's funny. And I, I, I never knew that, um, but there were some, when I was first starting, some kind of funny... Um, interpretations of, of misunderstanding the name and I remember this one Boston newspaper on my very first tour thought I wanted to be called M my lord M M L O R D which <laughs> do you remember what publication it was something in Boston if you named you know whatever the popular weekly was okay. in the 90s that would be it because <laughs> I, I was the music editor for the Boston Metro for a long time and I would be very embarrassed if it was that publication. It, it was an advertisement, I think, maybe the Paradise or something, but I thought that was funny. And that, My that lord. Kind of <laughs> so you're, you're playing and doing this stuff in college. Are you bringing, like, multiple guitars with you on stage at that point, or um, are you tuning between sets or just figuring out how to play a string of songs in one tuning before switching to another or um i'm usually bringing about two or three guitars and i stick to about two tunings because um i didn't have guitar techs in those days uh, i'm lucky to have them now but in general uh for for the live shows i keep it exclusive to about two or three tunings at most because it's just too uh annoying to try to switch tunings throughout a show and you end up they end up falling out of tune if you keep changing them so i've learned over the years to just stick to uh about two or three right and so i guess i'm guessing that must limit to an extent the improvisational nature of a set like if somebody calls out a request there might be just an instance where you are unable to play it yeah that that happens every day really <laughs> so do you explain like no i've i'm not bringing that tuning on tour with me this this time around yeah it's just gonna it's just gonna mess up the guitar and then you end up sacrificing the tuning for the, the rest of the songs and so yeah I keep it pretty exclusive to two or three tunings. okay interesting so you're playing in college
college, and where, where did you go to college again? In San Luis Obispo, California, Central Central California. What was the name of the school? Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo. Oh, okay. And so at that point, you were you had started gigging. Did you know that you were going to take this seriously as a career at this point, or what, what were you studying? Literature. A few of my friends graduated and started teaching kids like literacy right out of college. I started doing that, which was a, a really rewarding job. I continued to just write in my spare time and perform very sporadically, but I never really had a great passion for performing. It was mainly this the same thing that got me excited in high school, which was learning other people's songs and writing my own songs, occasionally collaborating with people. But my plan was to just, you know, when you're 19, 20 years old, you don't have much of a five-year plan, 10-year plan, but I, I think I was just going to end up being a, a teacher of, of something to some level. Tell me a little bit about when you finally made that decision of well, I'm, I'm not going to teach anymore. I'm, I'm going to do this. It was when I was realizing that I could make a living financially off of this and I could quit my day job, which was which was teaching at the time. I started to tour a lot more. That was, I guess, the first seeds that were, were planted in, in the whole marketplace um, side of it, which I try not to think about too much. But yeah, that was that was the beginning was extensive touring I did in my in my 20s. Do you remember your last class you taught? No, no, it was it was mainly like working in, in clinics though with like with kids that couldn't read mm-hmm. uh, like one on one. So I never taught a class. Okay. It was more clinical. And at what point did you realize that you didn't have to do that or that wasn't necessarily your preference? I started well I made my first tape in the late nineties just for fun. I decided to send it out to some artists that I really respected just to get their feedback. And one of them was Hal Gelb from Giant Sand, mm-hmm. who I had met through some mutual friends in a band called Granddaddy. And he sent me a really nice note. Another one I sent sent it off to was Ira from Yola Tango. And, and he sent me back this really nice note. And um, that encouraged me to just keep going. So I eventually got an agent, this, this great guy in New York named Eric Dimenstein. That started to um, get some other fires burning. I ended up getting these really nice invitations to play with artists that I really respected. Um, Giant Sand was my first sort of backing band. And they took me on a tour of Europe and then Bright Eyes was my backing band and then My Morning Jacket and Rilo Kiley and that was great. Mm -hmm. It made it so that I didn't have to... um stay roped into you know three or four other other musicians it, it kept things constantly changing right and that's still what i respond to so you put out the first tape it's really fascinating to listen to because it with the exception of like a song or two it feels like what you're doing is fully formed at that point point. and i guess talk to me a little bit about that and in, in the vision for the whole project i knew i just wanted to do what what um i enjoyed mm-hmm. there was never a careerist angle towards it i knew that when i was 15 and, and learning these chord progressions and, and the excitement of that was kind of profound and i i knew that if I stayed true to what I was really excited about, uh, as opposed to thinking about the marketplace or what might sell, uh, I knew I had a feeling that I would, I'd be okay and I could keep music pure for as long as possible. I just uh, followed yeah, my instincts and uh, kept the recording in the studio as close as, as possible to the feeling that I got from recording on my four track in high school. Talk to me a little bit about like finding your voice literally just because your, your speaking voice does sound quite a bit different from your singing voice which is you know so also so distinctive the vocal side of things and, and the uh, you know the singing part of my work is completely unintentional unprogrammed and uh, uneducated <laughs> and it's something that I don't want to give it too much thought because I'm not that interested in um, becoming a you know a trained singer. I, I think trained singing is pretty boring, and none of my favorite singers I think ever uh, studied it. Uh, it's just something you do to tell a story, which I think was Johnny Cash's approach. A lot of my favorite singers, uh, there's just some some bad notes in there, and um, I just I just love that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved Louis Armstrong from an early 
age, and he never really seemed to have a voice that was really, um, in a textbook way, beautiful. But to my ears, he and Billie Holiday, because because of the uh, quality of, of their vocals, I can just listen to it forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those sorts of singers, you know, gave me confidence to just plug a microphone in and uh, get the message across, get the story across in the way that, you know, Johnny Cash sings. Follow your passion, which is, you know, the guitar for me. So that's where I, that's where my focus is, is the guitar and the voice is more of a secondary or a, a vehicle to get the lyrics across and, and, the, and a message across. Right. As opposed to showing off some of my range, which is not impressive anyway. <laughs> it's interesting you say that about the guitar being primary. And I wonder, you know, from hearing your debut and, and some of the earlier albums, you seemed to start with an instrumental was that it, that almost to declare that like hey guitar is the primary thing here I think that that was part of it I still love instrumentals and I put them on all my records because I think it's a good um, way to create space I think that when the vocal does come back it has a, a, an extra impact on you know whatever record you're listening to which is one of the reasons I don't really tour with just certain instruments I love recording with, with lap steel and violin, baritone guitar. But if if you have those instruments on every song, they start to get old really quick. Mm -hmm. So if you give these things a rest, they sound fresh when they return. So it's probably a very long way of of answering the question, but that's how I feel about my singing voice is a little rest is a good thing. Right. Were you always, with with like the first albums, there's a lot of experimentation going on with, uh, I, I don't know, are they loops or are they just samples or? I feel like all the records have have had different experiments on them, uh, so I'm not sure which one you're talking about. I do I do love s- samples. Yeah, what that was that always part of the vision as well. Yeah. Uh, that was just uh, experiments that happened in the studio, borrowing from from really, really, really old records, mm-hmm. trying to um, put them on as a uh, just a texture that confuses the listener, also, but hopefully draws their ear a little bit closer to the speaker to try to figure out exactly they're listening to. I like that feeling when you don't know exactly what you're to. I saw you play, I think, I don't know what tour it was, but you were opening for Vic Chestnut. I think it must have been like 2003, maybe. It was in Cambridge. And it's an anecdote I share with friends when just talking about interesting shows. And, you know, I always love concert stunts. You know, there was this band, Arabon Radar in Providence, where the guy like put the headstock of his guitar on the stage, plants it and like catapulted into the audience, things like that. But I remember we're just playing on your own and you had Vic Chestnut's drums set up behind you and you just invited some stranger up to play a waltz beat oh i, I don't remember that but i'm, I'm glad i did I hope <laughs> so that's what i was going to ask was that something you were doing the whole tour or was it just a spontaneous thing of seeing the drums behind you and saying hey does anybody play drums yeah uh that was completely spontaneous uh it's something that i think probably only happened once uh as far as asking someone to play a waltz beat on the drums sometimes i'll have people come up and play uh different instruments uh that i don't know keeps keeps me on my toes yeah so so you'll do that occasionally still where, where you'll call a stranger up yeah you know especially if i'm working on on a um, a song that either i've played too many times or sometimes a song that i've never played it's it's fun to have have a guest who uh, you don't know that's cool does it ever happen where you'll call somebody up and then become friends with them later in life or play with them again no that's that's never happened <laughs> I, i'm just thinking I, I guess there's that actor's studio clip of a uh, pre-fame bradley cooper asking Sean Penn a question and uh, I forget what happens in the clip but he, he says something like Sean Penn's like well you gotta do this or else you'll never get famous oh uh, how funny no it no, hasn't happened to me yet but right so you do the fir- first few albums and you're, you're developing a consistent sound and, and expanding upon it each time at what point do you begin she and him uh, that came about after an invitation from a filmmaker who was making a movie and wanted me to do the soundtrack 
Jack and um, Zoe was one of the stars and um, he had the idea to get us together to cover a Richard Thompson song. Uh, I knew I loved her voice from uh, hearing her sing in Elf and um, it always seemed to me that when I remember hearing her voice that this is a, a singer, this is someone who probably has a lot of records and I was surprised to find out that she had never made a record. We ended up getting along really well in the studio and she mentioned she has had a lot of unrecorded demos and I said I'd, I'd love to hear them and she sent them over and I thought they were great. A lot of them reminded me of something that the Ronettes or the Crystals might have recorded. A few years earlier I had bought the Phil Spector box set uh, Back to Mono and that had this really big influence on me on because I was just getting my feet wet with producing records. When you start learning about his Phil Spector's uh, innovations that opens up uh, a lot of doors. When I heard uh, Zoe's demo tapes I thought this would be an exciting place to take these songs and also start experimenting with some of the tricks I was learning from studying Phil Spector's music. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just wanted to make one record but it snowballed a bit and um, now we, we've made about I guess five records. Wow. And was that your first uh, foray into producing somebody else? No, I did a little bit of work with Jenny Lewis. I, I co-produced her record Rabbit for Coke. Oh, okay. That's a good one. And I knew I, I enjoyed that process. Uh, it's fun to, to get out of yourself sometimes. Yeah, work work with other songwriters. Did producing other people change the way that you like to be produced? No, because I only produce myself. Yeah. Uh, this record I made last year was the first time I ever, ever co-produced. Ever? Um, yeah. Wow. So it was an experiment for me. That's amazing. And so what made you choose the, the Arcade Fire guys? Well, I love their music. I love the musicianship. The um, co-producer was, was a guy who worked a lot on their, their most recent records. We just hit it off. I, I loved his instincts. I also wanted to um, just try something new. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was up for that also. We ended up uh, having a great experience. Yeah, did you find in making all these records on your own, w would it get stale at all? Or, or is that part of the reason? Or I don't know. I guess talk to me a little bit about that something new instinct. The only time music gets stale for me is when I have to tour for like months and months on end. So I don't do that anymore. Other than that, music is, is never stale for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm fortunate to still have that fire for writing and uh, learning new things on the guitar and, and new things uh, in music production. Yeah, what, what, what's something recently that you've learned on guitar that you've been excited about? Uh, I have a new tuning that's kind of an open B. Okay. And uh, that has turned into a few new songs. Uh, one of them is the first song on the, the new record. It's called Migration of Souls. Oh, great. That's really cool. There's a few songs on the new record that I wondered, do, do you have kids? One, yeah. Is, is that the, the person in the Snowman song? What's the name of that one? Uh, Steven Snowman, yeah. yeah. Is that, is your son Steven? No. Um, Wallace Stevens has an, an incredible poem about a snowman that always comes to mind every winter. It's about having a mind of winter to get through, you know, difficult seasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's where the title comes from. That's interesting. Yeah, there's just something about, there's there's a feeling on the record that I got. I mean, I know there's the migration theme, but there also seems to be a, a little bit of talking to a child with the, uh, what's the name of the song? The Heavens? Heavens Heaven's Hammer. Yeah, Heaven's Nail and Hammer. Yeah. Yeah, um, when you have a kid, you start thinking about the next generation, and that ends up infiltrating all your thoughts. It changes you in, in, in a lot of ways, and uh, it ends up coming through in, in the songwriting. So, yeah. Yeah. How, how old's your kid? Uh, he's seven. Oh, awesome. My son's about to turn seven next month. Yeah, it's a great it age. Is. Um, do you feel, do, do you have any musical exchange with him? Christmas is always an, you know, an exciting time for kids because, um, you know, there's so many songs to that he instantly knows the lyrics for and he can sing along to because they're, you know, ubiquitous. They're in the air. And uh, so he gets a lot of excitement from that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine like with the She and Him Christmas album, is that playing in your house or are you just like, no, enough of this? A little bit of both. <laughs> I always like getting a kick out of looking at like Spotify stats and stuff. And I was kind of surprised that Chinese translation is the top song for you. Do you pick that one as one of your top hits? Um, I don't see any hits on any of my my records um but uh it's yeah that's one of those things that i don't really 
think about too much. Um, I know which songs people request at shows, and that is one that pops up a lot. I can't complain. I, I, that's a song that I, I still like. Mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely a lot that have not stood the test of time for me, but that one has, I think. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I love that video, too. Thanks. Yeah, that's uh, this guy, Joel Trussell, did, did a great job with that. What is the song that you think that you continue to get the most out of when you perform it? That's It's a good question that I don't know the answer to because there's just so many that I'm still learning how to play. Whenever I go on tour, I, I try to put some new blood into the old songs without changing the foundation too much. You know, the best songs are the most versatile ones that I can either play solo or, or with a band or have it be a, a piano song instead of a guitar song or vice versa. Yeah, as a musician, when, when you do something like that, switch it to a different instrument, does it take you a long time to do that? Or are you comfortable enough with both instruments that you can just say, all right, these are these notes that I'm playing in this tuning, and this is what it looks like on the piano? I would practice it at home first on my own before I serve it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But but does it take a while for you to figure that out, or is it relatively? Uh, a couple of days, yeah. maybe, uh, to, to get it to a point where I can play without thinking about it, which is the best way for me to uh, perform a song, is to be able to listen to the big picture instead of you know trying to remember the chord progression. Tell me a little bit about, we, we touched upon a little earlier when you had started going on tour with people and then you'd kind of use them as your backing band and how that would keep things fresh. It's so interesting to me that most of your first records were created on your own. Tell me about taking these things that you created on your own to, into a collaborative space. Well, I learned a, a long time ago that if you try to do everything in the studio from A to Z, it's not as interesting as when you include other people, especially, you know, talented musicians. I've never, I'm not a drummer at all, so I've always collaborated with drummers, and it's the same thing with, with bass. Just sometimes that that input is enough to um, make the production interesting for me. Uh, I think with every record, you have to leave some space open to an X factor or a little bit of chaos or uh, some unexpected, unprogrammed uh, events that happen after you, you press the record button. I feel like if everything is um, already pre-written, the production can be kind of cold and um, not very interesting to listen to. But if you give your musicians space to um, be themselves and uh, add their expertise, then the production becomes more exciting to listen to. Was it always important for you to like vibe with these people's personalities before playing with them, or was was it kind of a chicken or an egg thing where you know you'd you'd play with them and then kind of get to know them better as people? It's usually they're friends of mine already or friends of friends. Most of them all have you know the ones I, I didn't know. They had you know a track record where I could listen to the music that they were making and uh, instantly we'd have something in common to um, to talk about and to to draw from. Mm -hmm. Post War was like the first record you played with other people, right? There's been uh, you know bass and drums ever since my first record. Oh, okay. But do you usually find you like to bring different musicians on the road than the ones that played with you, or is that a matter of timing and scheduling for the other people? Or It's timing and scheduling. The, the best thing is to, to bring out the people that you were touring with, excuse me, the, the, the people that you were recording with uh, out on tour, if it, if it works out. Mm -hmm. Everyone is very busy, and um, we always figure out something interesting for, for the live show. Right. Are there, are there any plans to do another Monsters of Folk? There's no plans for that. We had a great time with the one record we did make. There was an attempt to try to do a, a, another one a few years ago, but it, it kind of fizzled out. Mm -hmm. But we'll see. You know, we're all still friends, but we're all pretty occupied with all our different projects. Right. Tell me a little bit about, I know you, you were touring, I guess, in the fall, and by that point, you'd probably been done with Migration Stories. Is that a challenge to not play the new songs? Not really. I've, I've done very, very little touring between uh, the, the time of finishing the record to, to when I'm going to start up this tour. I enjoy the process of relearning the songs and thinking about them in, in how, how to uh, develop them on tour. Mm -hmm. So you haven't played many of these songs live? I've played none of these songs live. Wow, that's wild. 
Anything else you want to tell me about migration stories? There's there's definitely, I got a lot from it. it, it the thematic through line felt tangible. It, it was, mm-hmm. was that a, a conscious decision? Uh, yes, definitely. And it, that's why um, the record is, is titled Migration Stories. I think that the way that my songwriting uh, factory works is it takes in uh, all kinds of, of different media and music is just the it's just the processing plant for me to to get these to get all this stimulus and put it into something that I can uh, I can live with or have hope for the future no matter how negative the article that you might have read about in the New York Times this morning uh, about how we're treating each other especially how we're treating people that weren't born in this country do, do you have any first, not first necessarily first-hand experience, but uh, loved ones that are affected by this directly? My grandfather uh, immigrated from Mexico over 100 years ago. And so I see myself in all of the immigrants. And um, I think if um, people looked back in their own ancestry, they would see that uh, their ancestors immigrated from somewhere also. I hope that Americans get closer and closer to realizing that they they are us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. You've, you've had a lot of messages in your music, you know, like you take something like uh, What a Wonderful Industry, and that feels like a very cynical look at the indus- the music industry. But tell me how important it is for you to have that, to, to use language to make your point in addition to music. Uh, it's a huge part of it. I try not to be too wordy. Uh, I think that it, I could still express ideas on, uh, with instrumentals, and um, it might have the same impact impact or not more if the feeling is right. So much of it is what the listener goes into it with. Yeah, I'm excited to hear people's interpretations. They're, they're usually more uh, lucid than, than my own. They're always more interesting than, than my own interpretations of these songs. Yeah, tell, tell me about uh, a time when somebody's had a, an interpretation that has enlightened your own take on it. It happens all the time, uh, especially in the interview process. I remember this one time uh, I had a song called Seashell Tale. It was on a, a record I made a long time ago. There's some mention of cactus or needles from a cactus, and this German journalist really thought it was a song about drugs. We had this conversation for, for kind of a long time before she she realized that I had cactus in mind instead of, instead of uh, drug needles. Oh. Um, so that would be a good example um, of something that it probably would have been more interesting if I would have just let her believe what she wanted to believe because she's just as right as I am huh, as far as uh, where uh, where a song can go symbolic. That's great. Where, where is the, the, the insight from other people in the circle if, if the live performance is the end of the circle? In my mind, the circle uh, begins with the songwriting process, it moves on to uh, its adolescence, I guess, which is bringing it into the studio and uh, introducing it to people that have never heard the song who are musicians and uh, engineers. The song gets a little bit older. Adulthood is um, performing it live. I think uh, it's kind of strange to have a song that never really gets played live. It's always seemed kind of foreign. So the song is out there in the world, and, and that's you know another exciting part of the life of the song is when people start telling you what they think it's about or um, contradicting what you thought it was about. And uh, sometimes it takes years before you realize what you're writing. And I like that. And I like that too. Sometimes it takes years before you realize what you're writing. Wise words from Matt Ward on the life cycle of a song. His new album is Migration Stories, and it is out now on Anti Records. Check mwardmusic.com to get updates on his live dates. All right, so at the top of the show, I told you about how you can receive a $100 discount on a Berkeley online course. Well, thank you for listening all the way to the credits. So head over to musicismylifepod.com right now. There you can redeem this special offer as well as get a link to all sorts of free resources. This episode was edited by Talia Smith, mastered by Melissa Henderson, all visual assets coordinated by Mike DeBenedictus, and social media by Brooke Larson. Web assistance comes courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, Joe McDonough, and Chris Keen. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. 
Special thanks to Gabriel Reifer Cohen, Chloe Walsh, Shane Greenberg, and thanks to you for listening. Take note to join us on Monday, April 27th for special guest Lisa Loeb. Stay healthy, listeners. We'll talk soon.